Well, hi, and welcome to Central Church. Uh, thanks for joining us today for this special online service. Wonderful uh, just to have you joining us. The Bible says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name, and you are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Uh, when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I do trust that you know that uh, God is your Saviour and that He has saved us in the Lord Jesus Christ in His finished work for us on the cross. Our mission as a church is to make followers of Jesus by being followers of Jesus. What's really important to us is that that all people everywhere respond to the wonderful invitation of God that we would be saved from our sins and come to know Him. Uh, so welcome. Whether you know that or not, whether you are a believer in the Lord Jesus or not, it's great to have you with us. We trust that your time uh, is is spiritually enriching as you spend as we spend time together today. Uh, we would love to connect with you. Our Connect QR code is right there on the screen next to me. Uh, you could hold your camera up from from your phone and scan that, and we'll just take you to our digital Connect card. And we'd love to connect with you to share with you a little bit more about the life and ministry of Central Church. Uh, my name's Scott Muir, by the way, and I'm the senior pastor at Central Church. Uh, and we are a church in the heart of the city of, of Ipswich with a heart for the city of Ipswich. Uh, part of which is to invite the people of Ipswich to our faith course. That's coming up on starting on the 11th of November, so that's a Thursday night. And this is all about learning what it is to put your faith in the Lord Jesus. If you're a little bit unsure about what faith is all about, what the Christian faith is all about, uh, then this is the course for you. It's four weeks. It's just going to be a small group of people. We're going to enjoy really good food. We're going to spend some time just reading little bits of the Bible. And you don't need to know anything about the Bible in order to come. Uh, that would be our pleasure to host you and to spend time with you, to have great conversation together and, and to show you just what God says to us about him and about us and how we can live a life of faith in him. So that's coming up on the 11th of November. Uh, you can get involved in that by just going to our website, centralchurch.net.au and follow the links to the faith course there. We're continuing our series, week four of the series, I Google God. And look, I, I, my question for you, I suppose, is how good are you at saying sorry? Um, it's sometimes a, a word that's a little bit hard to push through our lips, isn't it? To admit that we've done something wrong and to say we're sorry. And if you're a parent, look, I've certainly experienced with my kids when there's a, a biff between two of the kids and you, you get them together and you want to talk them out and you want them to say sorry to one another. And it can be the hardest thing in the world for them to do. As we get older, maybe we get a little bit better at it. Maybe that's because we've seen the, the wonderful power that saying sorry and being forgiven actually has in our lives and what beautiful thing it does to relationships. And even more so when it comes to our relationship with God. And that's what we're gonna deal with today. This question of forgiveness the barrier that it forms in our that sin forms in our relationship with God, but then will, will God forgive us of our sins? If that's a question you've asked, well, today we're going to deal with that. Um, before we get there, though, let's spend some time in prayer. Please pray with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we stand before you today knowing that you are a just God, that you are holy and righteous, that you uh, do always that which is right and, and you call on your creation, us human beings, to be holy as you are holy. And Father, that's a bit of a scary thing for us because we're not. We know our failures. We know our sin. We know our hearts, that they are deceitful. And Lord, we pray as we come before you today, Lord, that uh, we might humble ourselves as sinners before you, our holy God. But we're ever thankful for what you've done for us. We thank you that though all have fallen short of your glory, uh, that there is justification 
a righteousness, not our own, but that comes from you, that there is redemption, that there is forgiveness of sins, that there is life everlasting, that there is reconciliation, and that we have that not because of us, but because of what Christ has done for us. And Father, fill us each and every day with a wonderful sense of, of this life that we have in Jesus. Well, Lord, help us never to tire of of the gospel message, this, this good news that there is salvation, that there is forgiveness of sins, and that it is ours through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, help us to live as people of faith. Lord, that we wouldn't be those who are looking to our own righteousness or good works, that those things would, that we might think would make us right before you, but we, that we would ever and only look to the Lord Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for saving us. We thank you that we are safe with you, that though we may go through the waters, the floods, the fires, all the trials of life, that there is safety and security with you. And gracious Father, we want to pray today for um, our land, our, our nation here in Australia. Uh, Lord, as there is still many, many people affected by sickness and disease, particularly COVID. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, bring relief. Uh, Father, that there would be in the, in the horizon, not very far off, uh, a reducing of those numbers of, of, of infections. And Lord, some return to normality. We pray for those who grieve over lost ones. We pray for those who are sick and even long-term sick through COVID-19. And Lord, we would pray for your ongoing protection for us as a people. Father, we look forward to Christmas. Uh, Lord, we pray for this upcoming season, uh, now not terribly far off from us. We want to pray, Lord, that we might be excited for the celebration of the Lord Jesus, that our nation still sees this as something to celebrate, though perhaps not really knowing completely what it's about. Lord, might we as believers in Jesus be ever vocal, be excited, be the ones who are shouting from the rooftops uh, the good news of the Saviour born to us. Uh, Father, we pray for our Christmas events. We pray particularly for Central Valley Church with its, its big carols night in December. We pray, Lord, for preparations for that, that they would be going smoothly. Uh, lots of people would come and that there would be a boldness in talking about Jesus uh, Father, we pray for our uh, Christmas Eve services, uh, Lord, that that too would be a wonderful celebration, but also an opportunity for, for people from church to bring friends along. Lord, give us the, the boldness to, to invite somebody to come to church, to come to a carols night, and the boldness to talk uh, about the gospel. Uh, Father, we pray for our time here today. Thank you that we can join together. Thank you that you uh, are near to us. Thank you that you are a forgiving God and help us to understand more of this today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to read from the Bible. Uh, the passage I've chosen today is a passage which I think shows something of the, the scandal, if I can call it that, of, of forgiveness. Uh, here is what to many people is a is quite a shocking story as Jesus interacts with those who are crucified next to him. So I'm in Luke 23, verses 22 to 43. Uh, you'll find it on the screen, and this uh, week is from the NIV. Uh, two other men, both criminals, were also led out to, uh, with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him, they offered him wine, vinegar, and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. 
And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what else deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to say those words as well. Remember us when you come into your kingdom. We know that Jesus has entered his kingdom, that he sits at your right hand. And oh, that, that we might know for sure that we are in your kingdom. And we know this is possible right now because of what you have accomplished on that cruel cross that we've just read about. Lord, help us today as we examine these issues, as we see the heart of, of this man and the words that he spoke in his final moments or hours of his life. And Lord, that we might also see Jesus' heart for him and for us to receive us no matter what we've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, what are you guilty of? Uh, when I used to work in the public prosecutor's office, guilt was our stock in trade. It's what we did. My job was to provide enough evidence, compile enough evidence to the court to, provo- pr- to, pr- you know, to prove the defendant's guilt. And I used to love to, uh, chatting, in fact, to the old bailiff who sat through every trial in the courtroom. And I remember one day when the jury had just been sent out to de- deliberate, I went up to Bill and I said, what do you reckon, Bill guilty or not guilty? Uh, now, now, Bill's this ex-prison guard and he, he looked at me and he said, as far as I'm concerned, Scotty, if they're sitting in that dock, they're guilty of something. <laughs> and he's right, isn't he? You don't need to be sitting in a dock in a court to be guilty of something. We're all guilty of something. You'd be a brave person to say that you have never done anything wrong. You'd be deluded to say that. Every one of us has a dark place in our past that we avoid at all costs. But when the idea of guilt is mentioned, we're back there in a flash. We've all said or done things that we're not proud of, things that we know are wrong, things that have hurt others. Uh, Many years ago, there was a, a guy coming to church here at Central and a and after I'd known him for quite some time, in fact, he revealed to me the dark story of his, his history. Uh, how he'd just got many years ago his provisional license. He, he was out driving with some friends at night and he failed to stop at a pedestrian crossing. And that moment was fatal. He, he killed a person crossing the road. Isn't that devastating for him, for his whole family, but even worse for the victims of that family. And he was living with that guilt. There are lots of people, Christian and non-Christian alike, who live with guilt of, of aborting babies. Others have had guilt over things that they've said that have ended friendships. Uh, others ha- have guilt over the way that they've parented their kids. Many have, have guilt over their sexual sins. Guilt is such a powerful feeling. We feel a, the accusing finger of condemnation uh, pointing at us we think, uh, the, uh, when we think of those actions, those words, even those things that we, you know, we should have done but we didn't do. And this is how uh, Chris Costaldo describes that feeling. He says, we live in the shadow of such guilt and none of us, even the most circumspect, can avoid it. There's a corner of every house, including the most immaculate, that is in disarray, stained with the dirt of this world. Whenever you visit that corner in your heart where your injurious patterns of guilt reside, the voice of condemnation clears its throat and screams. What a weight to bear in life. Many powerful stories, though, emerge, don't they, in our, in our news of, of you know, victims who have been able to forgive their abusers. And that surely must go some way towards lifting that burden from the wrongdoer, to be granted the precious gift of forgiveness by the people that you have damaged. 
Uh, I've, I know I've talked before about the Abdullah family. They're an amazing example of this. They, they were the people you might remember from Sydney. It was early last year, four children from the same family were walking along the footpath and were run over and killed one Sunday, Sunday afternoon. And instead of living under the, the cloud though of bitterness, uh, Danny and Layla Abdullah chose to forgive the driver who killed their children. And Aussies looked on in amazement. There's something powerful about that. And of course, something helpful, I guess, for the driver. But is it enough? I mean, what about God? When the driver stands before God, is there any chance that God will forgive him? When you survey your sins, is there any way God would forgive you for what you've done? I think a lot of people have this vague sense that God forgives people, but too often I hear people who feel, well, they've just gone past that point of no return. Like one guy who showed up here at church some time ago and really just said, there's no point for me. Never be forgiven for the things I've done. That's what he said. Friends, hear this. Forgiveness is the scandal of the gospel. It is the shocking good news of Christianity. And this guy being crucified next to Jesus that we just read about, well, he's exhibit A of this scandal. Just read the story. Uh, Jesus is hanging on the cross after a completely unjust trial. Uh, firstly, the trial before the Jewish leaders and then the Roman authorities. He was sh stripped of his clothes, whipped and then made to carry his cross up the hill. They lay him on it, they nailed him to it, and then they raised him up. And alongside him, we're told by the gospel writers, were two others who were also crucified at the same time. Luke calls them criminals. And look, and understand that the Romans saved crucifixion for the people they really didn't like. I mean, they were, they were the, these aren't the guys who forgot to pay their parking fines. No, the, these guys were the real deal. These were bad guys. And, but there's a difference between the two of them. The first one, well, he mocks Jesus. Others gathered around on the ground. They were mocking. So this guy joins in. And he says to Jesus, look, if, you, if, you can, if you're the Messiah, why don't you do something here? Save us and save yourself. But the other guy, the other guy looks over and rebukes the first guy. Because this second guy has a sense of his own guilt. He says to the first criminal, we're being punished justly here, buddy, for our deeds. We're guilty. We're sinners. But this guy, Jesus, he's different. He's done nothing wrong. He's innocent. And the gospel writer doesn't give us any more detail about how this guy knew this stuff about Jesus. Maybe he'd seen him healing people somewhere. Maybe he'd heard his teaching. Or did he just simply see on this day the way that Jesus had conducted himself through the trial and through the beatings? Did he, did he see something of the power of of, a, of God on display in his humble submission to the injustices that he faced. We, we don't really know, but we do see this bloke's heart, clearly guilty, clearly without hope now as he is dying, and his only hope is to cry out to Jesus for mercy. And so he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then the scandalous part, what does Jesus say? Truly I say to you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. I reckon those words are scandalous. Something is scandalous when it's, it's like this immoral or unjust event that has happened and, and it causes outrage in the community. And I reckon Jesus' words kind of fit that definition. How can you say this sinner, this bloke, this criminal, probably never lived a righteous day in his life, how can he go to paradise with you? It... it, it can't be as, as easy as all that, Jesus. You can't just ask for a place in heaven. That seems wrong. Uh, last year, I led a funeral for a man who, who made effectively a deathbed confession of Christ. I, I remember getting a phone call from one of his daughters when he was really unwell. Uh, she said, look, Dad's just been crying out to God in the middle of the night. He was in palliative sort of care at the time. 
And they figured, well, maybe they should just contact somebody from the church. Um, this bloke had never been a believer, never been to church. I was uh, in, in Brisbane when I got that call and I was able to, though, to get on to our pastoral chaplain, Trevor, who went and saw him immediately. Trevor explained the gospel to him, read the Bible to him, told him about forgiveness that there is in Jesus, led him through a prayer of confession and faith. And shortly after that, he died. Was he forgiven? Was he saved? Is he in paradise? Uh, yes. How? Well, simply by faith. You see, the, the astonishing and, to be honest, unjust thing about the Christian gospel is that guilty sinners go to heaven, uh, not punished, not, no penance, no money needs to change hands. Because forgiveness is God's free gift to those who simply put their faith in Jesus. The Bible's really clear that forgiveness is ours when we trust in Jesus. Ephesians 1, 7, in him, that's Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. That word grace there means getting what you don't deserve. You are guilty and deserve punishment from God. You have a debt to God that no amount of money and no amount of work could ever pay off. And that's why we feel so burdened by our guilt. Nothing we can do will remove it. But Jesus can. And when he does, then you're free. The, the weight is gone. The debt is paid. And that's the wonderful blessing of forgiveness. Forgiveness frees your soul. Yeah. In Psalm 32, uh, King David in the scriptures explains this feeling of being weighed down by sin. He says, it's like your bones are wasting away. And he says that when he kept his sins from God, he, he, when he refused to admit them, he was groaning all day long. It felt like the hand of God was heavy on him. And I reckon we can relate to that, that sense of guilt. But when he acknowledges his sins to God, when he came clean, he felt the freedom of God's forgiveness. This freedom, that the power of forgiveness is such an important theme in the Bible. It comes up over and over again as though, you know, God knows how hard it is for us to understand true freedom from sin. And so God explains it in, in lots of different ways. Let's look at some of them first. He says, your sin is taken far, far away from you. Look at this from Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions, our sins from us. I reckon that's, that's a pretty amazing way of expressing distance, isn't it? As far as the east is from the west, you can imagine the psalm writer looking as far as he can in the one direction and then as far as he can in the other direction and saying, that's what God has done when he separates you and your sin. Geographically, it's as far as it could possibly be one from the other. Jesus has carried your sins an infinite distance from you. You're safe in his presence, washed, clean, sinless. Uh, then there's this from Isaiah 38, 17. Uh, but in love, you've delivered my life from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Hear God say, your, your sins are hidden, they're out of sight. He's put them away. It's a very deliberate act of God. And the motivation is, is love here, isn't it? God's love. Sin had, had left him in the pit of destruction, but God has completely fixed that problem. It's like a dad's magic, isn't it? It's gone. Where is it? It's gone. Not only that, he squashes sin dead. Um, Micah 7, 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquity, iniquities underfoot. I like that. It's like a cockroach, isn't it? He's treading on it, squashing it down. And, and then as if to make it more certain, he goes on, you will cast, God will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Casting them into the depths of the sea. And, and look, this is in the day before uh, you know, research submarines could come and find things like the wreck of the Titanic on the seabed. In Old Testament times, when something was hurled into the sea, it stayed there, right? Uh, talking about this passage, uh, uh, Corrie Ten Boom, uh, you might know her name. 
Uh, she was famous in World War II for protecting Jews from the Nazis. She and her sister were both sent to Nazi prison camps. And Corrie writes a lot about evil and about forgiveness. And she talks about this verse and the, and the way God hurls our sins into the sea. And she adds, and then he puts up a no fishing sign. Why, why does she add that? Well, because she knows the human tendency to, to drag up what God's got rid of. For some reason, we still hold on to those feelings of guilt when God has dealt with them. We need to see ourselves with God's eyes. And his eyes are forgiving eyes of love and acceptance. Uh, there's more, Isaiah 43, 25. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God blots out your sins. He remembers them no more. Uh, you know, let's just take that first part there. Blotting out is to is to remove from the, the record books, taking the ink and so fully blotting the writing that it just can't be read, ever. The New Testament says the same thing in Romans 4, 8, where Paul says that the Lord will not count your sins against you. It's, it's like a criminal record and, and all that you've ever done, all of your, your lies, your gossip, your greed, your anger, your discontent, your slander, your lust, your hatred, you, you name it, all of it is written there. But God has got this big, dirty, Nico pen and he's crossed it all out. And then he remembers it no more, which is kind of a bit odd. God doesn't forget stuff, right? God, God's got a mind that we just can't forget. But, but notice it doesn't say that he forgets. Forgetting is something human beings do because our brains are weak. I forget my kids' names all the time. But God remembers your sins no more. That's not passive, not forgetting through weakness, it's active. He chooses not to bring those sins to mind. He puts them out of his mind. So I hope you're getting the point here. God's gone out of his way to make sure you get it. Over and over again, it's repeated. Your sin is dealt with. He forgives completely. And friends, that's... that's any sin, there's no amount of, you know, there's no sort of talk of big sins and little sins and some sins he can forgive, but other sins he can't. As you know, as though he overlooks the big stuff, but well, the, uh, sorry, the little stuff, but the big stuff, that's another story. That's not the case at all. His grace has no limit. But just because there's no limit doesn't mean it's cheap. Generally, when there's an oversupply of something, it gets cheaper for us to buy, right? I mean, we're coming into mango season. I love mangoes, but I can't buy them now because they're just way too expensive. When there's a lot of them coming through the markets, they're cheaper. And so when there's plenty, that's when I buy them because it's cheap. But don't ever think that God's grace is cheap. It's in abundant supply. He does abundantly pardon, but the cost of the life of his precious son. That's what it cost. You see, as Jesus hung on that cross, he could offer that repentant criminal next to him a place in paradise, only because Jesus himself would die. When the first criminal hurled the insults at him, and saying, why don't you, you save yourself and us? Well, Jesus was saving human beings. He was doing it by his death. The good news can only be broadcast because Jesus died for sinners. See, when, when, when God hides your sin, when he casts them in a way, he's not ignoring the seriousness of your sin. He's not just laughing and kind of shrugging it off, no big deal. Sin is serious. It's deadly serious. And it was Jesus who died in your place so you could be free. The injustice of forgiveness isn't simply that God freely pardons sinners. The injustice of forgiveness is that the righteous one, Jesus, died for the unrighteous ones, you and me. <laughs> That's kind of unfair, isn't it? But it was necessary. God's justice demanded it because God is just. He must punish sin 
But when your faith is in Jesus, your sins are punished in him. He takes your punishment on himself. So the debt is paid. It's just that it's not you that pays it. Jesus pays it. Listen carefully to these words from 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake, you and me, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin. Who knew no sin? He wasn't a sinner. But so that we, you and I, could become the righteousness of God. Jesus took on sin. He carries our sin. And he takes it away from the presence of the Father. And now, don't get the thinking, this wasn't some abusive relationship where God made Jesus do something that he didn't want to do. Jesus willingly came into our world and willingly died because there was no other way to lift that weight of sin. And that's precious. Forgiveness was costly for Jesus. And I hope, therefore, it's precious to you. It should be. I started by asking what you're guilty of. And friends, Jesus invites you to bring that thing, all of those things to the cross. And that's where he'll nail it. And that's where it stays, it dealt with, finally, the burden removed. And God writes, cancelled over that sin. And so the only question is, what's stopping you? He, he forgives. And his forgiveness is full and final. It, it, it opens up the, the door to that future with God. The sin barrier removed, meaning peace and joy with him. Come to him. Be freed by his forgiving grace. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you forgive, that you are merciful and kind, that you don't treat us the way our sins deserve, but in Christ you set us free. Well, Father God, if there are people today hearing this who haven't experienced that freedom, who perhaps through their pride have not been able to say that word sorry to you, oh Lord, I pray that you would soften their hearts, that you would break down that resistance, that they might come clean. Uh, Lord, knowing probably that feeling of that David expressed of their bones wasting away, their, their groaning. Lord, might they come to you and, and know your, that you will receive them in Christ. Father, for, for we who, who have expressed our sorrow to you and received your forgiveness, Lord, help us to live and walk in the freedom of that forgiveness. Lord, that we wouldn't go back to those sins and and burden ourselves with them where you do not, that we wouldn't let others punish us for sins that you don't punish us for. But Lord, help us to treat the grace you've shown us as precious by living lives to bring, that would bring glory and honour to you, that we might put off the old and put, off, put on the new, seeking to be holy as you, our Father, is our holy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We trust that your time with us has been uh, rich. And now I just simply pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with you. Amen.